We're all sailors here, right? I've got a couple of quiz questions for you. I don't think many of you will get both of them right. The first one, name the sailor who sailed the most miles in one boat. It's a pretty tough one, right? A lot of good sailors out there sailed a lot of miles. The next one's probably a bit easier. Who's the inventor of Rockner anchors? Some of you might know that one. The answer to both of those questions, well, it's the same guy. He's a humble man, capable, knowledgeable, quietly self-confident in a way that, well, only Kiwis can be really. This man is born in New Zealand, spent most of his life on the ocean. His name's Peter Smith. I'm an ambassador for Rockner and they kindly hooked me up with an interview with Peter. He was sailing north from Tasmania up to the Gold Coast and I met up with him interviewed him and well I could have spent hours well days and days his stories are endless I mean he spent his whole life at sea I tried to narrow it down and give you a brief overview of his life and some of his yeah some of the highlights really so we'll get right to it here's the interview of Peter Smith legend ocean sailor where were you born uh Wangarei. in what year uh 1947 I did reasonably okay at, at school got it got UE and then there was a new, my father was a builder, and they were bringing out the New Zealand certificate and building it. It was a brand new course that had never been used before. It's sort of like halfway towards a university degree. And I was hand-picked to, to um, do that, yeah. sponsored, you might say, by an outfit called Wagner in New Zealand. They were, uh, in, in Auckland, they were a um, um, big construction company. So I went through all that, I went, left, left home at 16, left one grade at 16, went down to Auckland. We were living on the smell of an oily rag. You worked in your holidays, so yeah. the, the holiday pay had to keep you going during, yeah, yeah. The, during the university years. I got halfway through the getting my certificate, and I did actually finish it, I, I got my degree, and um, I had this passion to build a boat or to go sailing. I built a um, Pied Piper. Wooden? Wooden, wooden yeah. uh, plywood Pied Piper. Yeah. I actually built that in the backyard of, of a place where I was boarding. Yeah. You know, these people were very generous and, yeah. and let me build the boat there. So every inch of that boat was begged, borrowed yeah. or stolen. There yeah. wasn't a damn thing we paid for. And was for. that off a plan or something? Or? It was, yeah, yeah, there's Townsend's Pied Piper. Okay. He's yeah. a very famous New Zealand yeah. designer. So um, that's what I was sailing on. Um, got that boat in the water. And it just sort of, you know, just, just went from there. Yeah. It, was just, um, it was just the fact, I'll just say lucky being in New Zealand. These things yeah. just sort of came together. People yeah. helped, people clubbed in, you know, sort of. So I was able to sell the Pied Piper and, and Compass Yachts. They heard that I was building a, um, a half-tonner. It was a um, um, Smith's design from Wangarei. Um, they designed this half-tonner, and I got hold of the plans, and I went up and I bought a whole load of um, strip plank cowrie. It was, it was convex, concave machine, all ready to yeah. go. Bought it back to Auckland, and um, started to build the hull of this. I built the hull of this half-tonner, and... Compass Yachts decided they wanted to take a mould off it and start producing fiberglass boats. Oh. Um, and the deal was they were supposed to give me a percentage of the company and be part of the deal. Well, I was pretty young and naive and they took the moulds and I didn't get any part didn't of the sign. company. Yeah. And they ended up making a lot of boats out of that? Yeah, they did. That became the Compass 30. They, oh, wow. they built a lot of them. A lot of them, yeah. So I was so pissed with all this and getting screwed <laughs> on. There was yeah. a good friend of mine who I used to flat with was working for Salthouse Brothers, famous New Zealand company. Yeah. So I went along and saw Salthouse and said, I have the technology, I'm an engineer, and I have the technology for fiberglass cord structures. And um, I know enough about fiberglass now. Do, are you, you interested in forming a partnership? and use your name and your capital, use my technology, yep. and we're going to start building fiberglass boats. So we formed a company, and we called it originally Salthouse Custom Glass Boats, and then Custom Glass Boats, and then the, the, the Cavalier 32, the first boat we built, we decided to call it Cavalier Yachts, and then Salthouse and I split. So we were very successful. We built over 100 Cavalier 32s. We built the, the Cavalier 39. We built a number of, of um, one-man fishing boats and we a whole lot of stuff. What age were you at this stage? 22, 23 oh, wow. years old, 24 very, years old. Very like young, that. huh? Yeah, very young. A tycoon already? Yep. Well, no, yeah, <laughs> I was young and naive. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, people like the names, Bruce Farr, all those sort of names, they're all peers, they're all, you know, we all sailed yeah. together and we're yeah. all making our, growing our oats and... It's um, a golden time. Sowing yeah. our oats, it was a golden time, yeah, yeah, I guess you might say, yeah. So yeah. a lot of, lot of very good friends back in those days. We were in the middle of a, of a worldwide depression um, and we had three half-tonners sitting in Sydney or in, yeah, in Australia 
Then Muldoon brought the 21% sales tax or 20% sales tax overnight. Yeah. So it. And, yeah, yeah. And killed the whole industry. Yeah. Wiped out all the boat builders, wiped yeah. us out. Overnight we were broke. I said, I've had a guts on the New Zealand and it's yeah. bureaucracy and all that sort of shit yeah. and never went back. The idea of Custom Gla or of Cavalier was it was going to support me when I went sailing. Yeah. I never intended yeah. to stay in business. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I just made a living from there on out of the country. Um, basically, we were broke when we left. In fact, we were going to sail around the world in three years. And within two years, we were broke. That was on a boat called Aptrex, Cavalier 39. So we left Papua New Guinea and went up to Hong Kong and, and around um, back to the Philippines, backwards and forwards. Within a year in the Philippines. I was looking for the opportunity to build. I had, I had three people wanted boats. I was looking for a place to build boats for people. Um, and then in, in uh, Brunei, I ran into someone who wanted me to finish the Daily 47, which was under construction at the time. And at the same time, a Dutch restaurant owner in Brunei said he wanted to buy, he was looking for a boat and he wanted to buy Aptrix. Uh -huh. So we sold Aptrix, picked up the contract. I was going to build it in Brunei, decided not to. I had a good sailing friend of mine who had a property in France, so we went to um, Brittany. So I built this big Dalu in, in the UK. Well, I started in France. We gave up because of the language and took the whole operation across to England. Built the boats, built this boat, um, Kiwiroa there, uh, the last boat I built there. Put that in the water and then started from there. I haven't really worked seriously. I haven't stopped and worked really since, since then. Tell us about the, the inspiration for this boat. No, number one, back in those days, we were, boats were going missing, yep. and we reckon they were hidden containers. So I decided I wanted a metal boat. I couldn't hack steel, and I had dreams about possibly making a living chartering or maybe circumnavigating and chartering on the circumnavigation, all that sort of stuff. And I was young, and I had the energy, and, mm. and things just came together. Yep. Um, I had the contract that got me going. That, that, that I got all the machinery and everything else. She was a full-out project, single-handed by myself with, with my wife giving me a little bit of help. 22,000 man-hours on this boat, yeah. and I did it in four and a half years. Yeah. I'd made enough money, and also at the same time as building the other boats and doing the other projects I was doing, I was able to accumulate all the, all the stuff I needed. Yeah, you know, okay. I accumulated all the supplies and materials. Yeah. A lot of stuff fell off the other boats. Yeah, yeah. All the sort of thing, you buy two instead of one, yeah, and yeah. all that sort of thing. You know, So it became affordable. Yeah. I could never have done it otherwise. So, okay, for about... Five or six years, I kept a diary, or a, uh, I had a book, and in that book I wrote my perfect boat, all the things I wanted, all the things. Yeah. As we were sailing around, I'd see things, I'd, I'd experience things on my own boat, and and in building the Dalu, you're in France, and you get to see, and you're putting yeah. a boat together for another client. You just get to the stage where you have an idea what the perfect boat would be. So I had a hernia operation, so I spent six months recovering from the hernia operation, and in that time I planned out the boat. Um, had the drawings done, I actually had the baselines done by uh, a naval architect in the UK. I didn't trust myself to do the actual baselines, yeah. you know. The problem with aluminium is, is the welds on aluminium boat are 60% as strong as the base material. Yeah. They, they, so it's quite a substantial loss of strength um, with the welds, uh, whereas with steel it's almost 100%. Yeah. Um, so, by, so what I did is I built the boat Chine, but I built, I had two 25 foot long by 10 foot wide by 8 mil and 10 mil sheets of plate. So I've only got one vertical weld and the horizontal chine welds in this boat. So the boat is super strong. Yeah. You haven't cut the plate into yeah. a whole lot of different sections yeah, yeah. and then weld it and then put them through rollers and done compound curving and then weld them all together. You know, and you then get um, what we call this um, starved dog effect. You get a lot of um, distortion. Yeah. So you then got to use a lot of filler. Yeah. This boat's got no filler. Yeah, yeah. This boat's just like the day I built it, in inside and out. Yeah. When I designed the boat, the, some of the things I wanted was, or I had this book, I wanted a proper four-peak. I, I was going to go to Hank's sales, so I've got actually a large four-deck locker that's on the deck mm -hmm. that, used to take, that I could put oh, my headsaws yeah. into. Yeah. I wanted a walk-in engine room so that I could actually work on the engine. On most boats, you've got to lift all the, 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 the oh, yeah. cabin floors, mm -hmm. and the, you can't live on the bloody boat. Yeah. You know, it's really difficult. This boat had all that designed out of it, everything. And it's perfect. I can work in that engine room. I can have guests on board having a party. They don't even know I'm there. All my, all my pumps, all my systems are in that engine room. The engine comes out through that. This comes off. That all comes out. This comes out. And I, I built everything. I built the hatches. I would not put a commercial hatch on this boat. So I designed my hatch in such a way that they can be dogged, still ventilate, and no one get into the boat. Okay. There's four dogs on each hatch on all four corners. 
the rubbers can be replaced easily. The, the hatches are indestructible, they're stronger than the dead. Yeah. They've got proper combing, so I can actually open them when it's raining, and I, don't, I can you get a good get draft, yeah. but I don't get wet. Yeah. The, the interior was designed for basically for high latitude sailing, yeah. and it's not ideal for the tropics. Nowadays people want big open saloons, you'll yeah. see here, yeah. I've got a very closed saloon. But that saloon, when you when you get rolled or when you get yeah. knocked around at sea, yeah, it's yeah. perfect. It's yeah, designed yeah. for offshore. It's designed yeah, exactly. for long distance fascinating. Yeah. The wheel steering, the all the sheaves are custom built sheaves. So I've actually taken aluminium pulleys. They're ten inch. The sheaves are still the original. I've got a complete new steering system sitting down below. I've still got the you original wires. The I'll never use it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's just perfect. It still runs like the day it was built. Mm. I made my own quadrant. Yeah. Nothing on this boat has failed. There was nothing. Yeah. nothing and you were failed. saying how many miles have you done? Um, in straight lines across a globe, 300,000. Just stand there, I'll just hang on a minute. If you look at all those miles, it's quite easy to see. It started this globe when I launched Kibera. So you can see here, you look at the number of times I've been up yeah. and down. I've actually circumnavigated North America done the Northwest Passage single-handed three years ago. I've been up and down the um, up and down this route here five times. Iceland down to Morocco or Portugal, which I was using as a base, all the way up and did Svalbard. We got to 85 degrees north in Svalbard. Mm -hmm. and that particular year we, we were further we got further north than any other, any other boat. So you can navigate Svalbard. Been up and down the Greenland west, Green, uh, Greenland west coast four times. South Georgia. Um, so I was using Falkland Islands as a base for Antarctica. I was using Falkland Islands as a base for South Georgia. And I also spent three seasons down in, in Patagonia in the um, Beagle Channel. Mm. Um, the winters and everything, the whole lot down there. Did all the inland waterways from, uh, from Port of Mont all the way down to the Beagle. Um, it just, yeah, just goes a lot of miles. And so 300,000, that's just those straight lines without doing all the zigzags, backs and forwards? Yeah, so I reckon I've probably done 350, yeah, sort of thing. And all in the same boat without really having to do... All on this boat. Without having to make too many... I mean, obviously fixing in that, but you haven't had any big major adjustments or... No, no nothing major, no. I do all my own refrigeration. I do all my own wiring, oh, yeah. all my own electrical. Oh. In fact, I, I had the head, get, the head off that Cummins twice, done it all myself. Um, and if you can't do these things, I mean, I, I took the head off that damn thing and fixed that Cummins at the top end of Baffin Island after I come out, uh, come out of the Northwest Passage. Yeah. Because if I didn't fix it up there, I yeah. was going to end up there for a winter. Yeah. So you were ca carrying a spare head gasket or you cut oh, Of course one? I do. I carry yeah. valves, yeah. head gaskets, yeah. everything I think I can fix myself. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't fix everything, of course. I can't hone a cylinder. and I, But I carry, you know, spare starter makers. I carry a, a Bendix spring starter maker for batteries go down. Yeah. Whenever I do these major passages up into the high latitudes, um, South Georgia, Antarctica, the Svalbard um, in particular, and the Northwest Passage when I did that trip. I, the boat is provisioned and equipped for two years because if you get iced in, yeah. you're there for you're two there. years. You're there yeah. for, well, a year to 18 yeah. months, you know, before you get out again. Yeah. So you have to be prepared for that. Yeah. So I had that in the back of my mind when I built the boat. All my tanks are down below waterline, so the, the fuel won't freeze. Yeah. Water tanks are as low as I can get them. Um, the top of the tanks could freeze, yeah. uh, to say there. Yeah, you sort of, I don't know, all these things are in the back of your mind when you do all this design work yeah. and you, you prepare. Well, I see, I see there's no solar at all in this boat. What's your mm -hmm. concept there? Well, there's, there's two things. Number one, I don't believe that solar, to me, is going to produce the energy I need, particularly to run a big refrigeration system. I've got a seven cubic feet deep freeze, you know, that's big stuff. And you can't run that on alternative energy. I, I don't believe in alternative because it doesn't generate enough juice for me. It doesn't charge my batteries when my autopilot's been running all bloody night and I need to charge them in the middle of the night, etc., mm. etc. You know what I mean? It's too, it's too vulnerable. It's too, it relies on perfection and perfect conditions yeah. all the time. Mm. I sail in unperfect conditions all the time. But one of the big things for me was, and I learnt this in, when I was in the Falkland Islands, I see these boats with all their solar panels and their wind and their wind generators, etc. That stuff would last five minutes in most of the places I go, particularly places like the Falkland Islands where mm. 50 knots is normal. Yeah. You just tear that year apart, and yeah. it's windage, and it's just it's just so vulnerable. Yeah. There's just no way.
Do you have a water maker? No way. Why the hell would I have a water maker on board? So you collect water? I collect my. I built the boat so my decks are a, a complete water, water catcher. Yeah. In fact, we had rain here about three weeks ago. I, I emptied one tank and I was into the other tank. And we had bloody rain. And I thought, oh, they charged me for water here in, in this bloody marina. So I thought, oh, oh bugger, it's rainwater. It's pure, nice and clean. I knew it was coming off the ocean. This is the big thing, making sure you're getting clean water. Mm. So I um, it was raining fairly heavily. I opened the tanks. I can fill my tanks off my decks faster than I can using a high-pressure hose. Mm. I'm serious. I'm not joking. No. 20 minutes and I can take 1,200 litres of water. Yeah. And, and well, I only, the decks, I, if it's raining heavily, I make sure they're clean, which they are. They're always clean. I don't use the cockpit. The cockpit drains yeah. separately because it's a, it's a dirty area. But the decks, yeah, fine. Yeah. And I have never wanted for water. Since 1978, I left New Zealand. Mm. To this point now, I've never, ever run out of water or wanted for water. We have, you know, backup systems. We use we use salt water in the galley. If I've got a really long passage, yeah. I'm going to be at sea for a long time. Um, we use the, the salt a lot for rinsing and all that sort of thing. Yeah. I use the salt for steaming vegetables instead of cooking in fresh water. Yeah. And how much water do you carry? 1,200 litres? 1,200 litres, yeah. yeah. And, and if, you don't, if it doesn't rain, how long does that last you? I've gone six months. Six months with 1,200 litres? Yeah. Two people or by yourself? Two people. Yeah. yeah. That's been quite frugal. So normally yeah. I would get um, round about eight weeks, yeah. maybe ten weeks out yeah. of my tanks, even if I don't try. Mm. So I tried to get through the Northwest Passage in 2018. Uh, that was a voyage that we started in Portugal. So you know these voyages, you, you rack up a lot of miles just yeah. to the, you get to the starting line. Yeah. So you end up in a Pern a Pernavic on, on, in Greenland, which so that was the third time I've been up the Greenland coast. Um, so I'd, I'd gunk hold, I'd, 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 I'd explored, you know. The, the whole of the Greenland coast from Cape, Cape Farvel up to Apernavik, knew all the anchorages and all the places. You know, most of it's uncharted. You hit rocks and stuff, you know, it's just, yeah. just the name of the game, which again is why you design a boat like this. Um, the average the average sort of boat nowadays, there's no way they, they wouldn't even start to survive no. those sorts of voyages. Yeah. Um, so anyway, when I come through the Northwest Passage, I got, I got a text or an email or something from my ex-partner. She said, oh, congratulations. So I said, oh, why? What's that about? She said, you've just circumnavigated North America. And I said, oh, have I? Here's your bloody hatches with the four dogs. Yeah. I've put mosquitoes. I lived in Papua New Guinea, so I hate malaria. I've yeah. had malaria and, and dinghy. Screens yeah. on every hatch in the boat. All the wiring is HO7 RNF. It's naval grade yeah. uh, wiring. It cost me £7,000 turning just for the wiring, just to oh. buy it. Go up there and poke your nose through there, and you'll see a proper four peak. Two, yeah. an two anchors are in there, the other anchor's on the bow. Um, those, when you're down in Patagonia, see those, those bags on the side? They're full of 120 metre lines. Oh, yeah. I used to have seven of them, there's five there now. In Patagonia, you need to. I've got a photo in Staten Island of Kiwi Row. I went up the mountain and took a photo. The photo in Staten Island of two anchors and seven lines ashore. Just spiderweb? Yeah, spiderweb. You spend all bloody day just setting the boat up. Mm. I carry so 100 it's... metres of chain and 50 metres of rope spliced into it in that locker. In the port locker I carry, um, well actually the chain is back here at the mast, yep. the big spurling pipe. There's 50 metres of chain and I carry 100 metres of line. So I've got 250 metre ropes and the stern windlass has got 30 metres of chain and 100 metres of rope. They're all ready to go. All ready to go. Yeah. Everything's all ready to go. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's the other thing. When I, when I designed the boat, lee, lee cloth here, lee cloth here, ditto in all the cabins. So from that lee cloth, I can look up through either of these hatches and see my headsails and my mast, I can see my wind decks. Yep. When I'm standing in the galley, in its normal galley position, I look up through the hatch, I see my wind decks and my main. Yep. And if I look hard, I can see the four stays as well. Yep. So Amazing. this cabin here, I used to call, call my son's cabin. We call it Craig's cabin because this is where, as a young man, he did his correspondence. This, this here is a table that comes up. Yep. Um, and he would do his correspondence on this three hours a day. And again, double lee cloths on all the... Yeah. All the bunks. So that's a forehead head, oh, yeah. um, which we hardly ever use, but it's for emergencies. That's um, no. yeah, that's a Dickinson um, fifteen thousand BTU yeah. uh, diesel heater. From here, <coughs> HF yeah. radio there. Th this again, I mean, stuff's evolved since I built the boat, you know. So the radio, by the way, has a manual tuner as well as an automatic tuner yeah. ATU. So I now carry AIS Pactor modem. The computer runs the Pactor and the radio. 
That's an old C80 yep. radar, which that there I've got a world suit of charts, so that's why I don't change it because yeah, the yeah. charts can't fit on a no, new. No, they're the big, the big cards. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I had the same. And um, open CPN on the computer. I carry two computers. So lead cloth up here. Um, at the moment, I've actually the underneath these the cushions of this stuff, but underneath this I've got waterproof covers. Yep. So I'll take these off the waterproof covers there. I put a I I've got a. I don't know, a lee cloth that goes across yeah. here. I can actually sit there with my feet that the goes across here, my feet I can't move. So I can sort of descend strap and yourself doze. in. Yeah, strap yeah. myself in, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Table That's all solid stuff, eh? This is all solid teak. Table opens up at both ends so we can sit yeah. about seven or eight people around it. Yeah. And you made all this stuff? Yep, everything. There's nothing on but this boat I didn't build. No one else worked on this boat. Did everything. Oh, I didn't make the stove, and that's the fixed oven underneath. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, that's refrigeration. That's a big refrigeration box goes back to the hull. Yep. Yeah. Big box full of stuff, and that is all deep freeze. That whole thing there is deep freeze. Oh, under here. Yeah. Yeah. So there's yeah. the there's the fridge there. Yeah, yeah. Um, you can see. Yeah, yeah. Holding plates again. Yeah. So an hour in the morning, an hour and a half at night, does all my battery charging. And does all my refrigeration. Yeah. And that's a 10 horsepower? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a 1 GM 10. Yeah, yeah, so it's using horse, a, what, a, nine, a, nine a litre an hour? A couple of litres a day, yeah. For, for, your, for your energy? For my energy yeah. total, yeah. The, the alternator is 200 amp on the generator yeah. and well, on the auxiliary. Yeah. And the main engine, I've got 100 amp plus a 60. And, yeah, yeah I carry so if you're motoring spare. around a bit. In fact, I carry a spare 200. I carry yeah. two spare for the main engine. Yeah. I carry yeah. spare starter motors for both engines. Yeah. Carry injectors. I change the injectors out every every um, thousand hours. I carry three sets of injectors for both engines. Yeah. This is the main toilet shower, which I never use inside the boat. I try and keep the steam out of the boat. I shower oh, in the yeah, cockpit. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty yeah. normal. And we also use it as a wet weather hanging locker. Yeah. So big double cabin aft here. My bike store underneath here. This table folds up and down. And this is another double cabin, um, which is full of. Stuff that's it's handy storage, storage stuff, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And underneath all these bunks, I'm carrying either spare parts or my tools. Or yeah. A lot of, yeah, yeah, there's enough boat putting tools on board to do pretty well anything and engineering yeah. tools. And this is what everyone lusts over, they can't, can't believe this. Sea chest under there. I only have one skin fitting below the waterline, that's it. Yeah, all and I've got three other skin fittings in there at waterline. Um, but the valves are above waterline, you know, yeah. so basically the boat's pretty safe. You can see oh, the stern tube, shaft, get, yeah. it, get it, that'll okay. You can see the size of my this, this steering, steering cables, cables, cables shaft yeah. brake. Yep. Um, down there, bilge, I just, I just run, a, I run a torch over that every time I walk into this engine room. There's no bilge water at all, so yep. any, any smallest leak of oil or water, I yep. pick up straight away. Um, that's a header tank, which I can use for emergency for both engines. Yep. Um, it also is the header tank for the heater. Yeah. And it's also a second fuel polishing system. The other thing, this is totally isolated from the hull, yeah. as you can see. So electrolysis is not an issue. Yeah. And um, also vibration and noise, yeah. pretty yeah. good. That's a beautiful uh, workspace. I, I couldn't live without it. I'm very yeah. happy with it. Yeah. 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 So 6,000 hours on that motor and all of the miles you've done, that's not actually that, you, you must sail a lot. Um, well, it is a yacht. You know, it is. Yeah, but I mean, there's people who've done 6,000 hours on a charter boat that's only 10 years old. No. Oh, yeah, no, no. no this, this... So you, you do sail whenever no, you can? Shit, no, I'll sail whenever I can, yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah. yeah. When I left the UK, I had eight or nine anchors on board. I had two CQRs, a Bruce, a big Danforth, a, um, an Admiralty Patton Pick. I had the dinghy anchor. Oh, and, and two deltas. There's the deltas, of course. You yeah, had two deltas. The deltas were my main anchors. They were 44 kilo, the biggest one that Delta made at the time. And I just dragged them all over, like in the Chesapeake. You know, I, they, the delta would be six feet under under the mud, and I was still dragging. Because Kiwi Road's a big, heavy boat, a lot of windage. So, and then I, I saw a bugle. I came through the Panama Canal. Someone else had a bugle on board, and I was quite interested. He was very enamoured with it, and he told me the setting characteristics, and I actually saw it all working. And it was certainly better than a than a, than a delta. But you did have to drag it quite. Science. Quite often, you could quite you could drag it quite away before it would set, and that was accepted. That was the way things were in those days. Like with the old CQRs, you knew that two out of five times you would have to pull the anchor up and re-anchor. I got back to New Zealand and had the thought and started playing around with anchors. Um, I saw the Spade. I was quite impressed with the Spade, Alain Perrault. 
the shape of the splayed blade interested me. So I started making some plywood patterns. I spent about a year making plywood patterns and, and dragging and, and trying to get the bugle concept to work. And I just could not get it to work. It kept, the, the, the models kept lying on their sides. And one day I got a bit frustrated and I got a piece of angle line and I just cramped it to, to where is, what is the skid now on, on, a, on a Rockner. I cramped it there and dragged it and it set. All of a sudden the weight was on the tip because the angle line kept the heel up. Mm. And I suddenly realised all the other things were, you know, I could, I could work those out. I could engineer those out, you know, the roll bar and all those sort of things. But it was getting it to set from the beginning, getting that, that tip to go down. And it was the skid that did it. I had a agricultural version of what I'd worked out. I took that and used that on a circuit navigation of New Zealand. And it worked every time and I was very happy with it. And people started to take interest and notice. Now, I, built, I must have built three or four hundred anchors um, for people who came up and said they wanted one when I built, when I built one. And very good reports from all of them. And I, I got some of these people are pretty, you know, they, they're well-known yachtsmen. People who have um, been around a long time and well-respected in the market. Um, they all got them and were very happy with them. So that gave me the confidence and I wanted to head off on a circuit navigation myself or continue a circuit navigation and take Kiriro down to the high latitudes, which is what she's designed for. And I didn't want to get involved in business, so I licensed the business. <laughs> I spent a lot of time, um, we, we played around with, with some ideas and everything else and we designed what, it, what it has become the, um, the Mark II the natural evolution of the original Rockner. The roll bar has become a foil, which does a lot more things than just make the anchor roll. We've been able to um, design a lot into the shape of the anchor, so we now don't use plate. We use plate for the shank, which is CNC machined. The blade is, is, is now um, is cast, so we can now, the blade is much more efficient in terms of, of strength and weight. Mm. So we can now actually get the Mark II has got a between a 10 and 15% increase in in blade area for the same weight. So a far superior anchor, but I'm not knocking the Mark I. We'll always sell Mark I's. People love yeah. them. They're, yeah. they're bulletproof and destructible. Yeah. But the Mark II is definitely a big step up. It's a, it's a, it's a, 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 a game changer in terms of generation of anchors. I think the Mark II is a generation three. So what is your plans for the next few years? Like, what, what, where, is, where is this boat taking you next? Ah. Uh, you are now, you've got a sore point here now. I really don't know what to do well, with my life. And at the moment, I'm leaving here on the 9th, three days time, four days, uh, to go back to New Zealand. Because I feel if I don't get the boat back to New Zealand now, at, 50, at 75, I'm going to be struggling to get it back. Well, that was quite an abrupt ending, wasn't it? But that's a sailor's life. We say goodbye quite often, and uh, it's often hard, but then we always want to go on to a new place. Um, I can tell you that yeah, the next day Peter set off by himself at 75, sailed over to New Zealand. I mean, if you look at his whole legs and everywhere he's sailed, that's a relatively small, just to hop across the pond really. But he did make it, I think, um, six days or seven days, something like that. And now he's back in Whangarei, where, he, where it all started off. Kiwi Row is at, anchored up there. And um, yeah, I don't honestly know what his plans are but I'm sure he'll have some. I hope you guys enjoyed that one. It was a massive pleasure for me to meet Peter, a proper legend of sailing, I would say. Uh, just lived life on his terms, um, complete freedom. Obviously, probably a bit selfish as, as you have to be if you're gonna live this way. But man, the things he's seen, the, you know, the circumstances he's been in, the decisions he's had to make to save himself and the boat, all these sorts of things pretty pretty incredible and also yeah to to be an inventor and to build all these boats and come up with a, with probably the best anchor there is and yeah have a family and there's a, a, a lot packed into that life and uh, pretty incredible to talk like as I said at the beginning I could have honestly talked to him for for days and days um, to you know hear his stories and and whatnot but Really, really stoked I got the chance to spend this time with him. Thank you very much, patrons, again. I hope this is, <clears throat> this is obviously a very different video than what we normally do. You know, when I meet people that I find really, really uh, interesting and credible, and, you know, and I think that you guys will, will find some interest in it too, I, I want to bring them to you, and I'll keep doing that in the future. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.